my interest in uveal melanoma came from sort of the other direction, which is from studying BAP1. And so the work that I'm going to tell you about today was uh, really more than five years in the making. And it was done uh, while I was at Genentech. I spent 10 years there before coming here mid last year. Um, so I'm just going to try and hit the highlights in 15 minutes. But if you're interested, it came out in science about two weeks ago. So many of you will know that families that have germline BAP1 mutations um, tend to develop malignancies. They develop them young. And uveal melanoma is one of the most common. So it's really clear that BAP1 is a potent tumour suppressor, but we really don't understand much about how it works. Looking at it from the other perspective, if you take uh, uveal melanomas that have metastasized, around 80% of them have a BAP1 mutation. So what is BAP1 and what's it doing? It's a d ubiquitinase and it binds several proteins, including ASXL1 and 2. And then what it does is it goes and removes ubiquitins from histone H2A, which then turns on transcription. So we were interested in trying to understand BAP1's function in general. Um, so we developed some mouse models to try and study this. First, we did the first obvious thing, which was knockout BAP1, and it was embryonic lethal. We then developed inducible knockouts, first across the whole of the mouse, and it, uh, the mice developed CMML-like disease. So then we said, OK, we've got to get rid of that out of the hematopoietic system. We developed another conditional, which um, was not in the hematopoietic system. And then we saw uh, tumorigenesis, other types of tumors. So to try and understand what it was about one, about BAP1 that was having this tumor suppressor activity, we developed a catalytic uh, mutant. Because BAP1 has these two domains, the catalytic and then the uh, protein binding. So I'll just skip through this quickly. But what we found is that the, um, the catalytic dead, BAP1, phenocopied the BAP1 knockout. So essentially, this is suggesting that it's really the catalytic activity of BAP1 that's having the tumor suppressor effect. So we then went on and started doing some studies in cell lines. And we began with mouse embryonic stem cells. We knocked out BAP1, looked at what happened. Turns out cells, the cells die. So we found the same thing in mouse embryonic fibroblasts. And this was pretty confusing, because if you think about it, a tumor suppressor, if you knock it out, you would expect cells to proliferate, not to die. But the good thing about this, and this is the bioinformatician in me was excited, is that it sets the stage for a lethality screen. So we used whole genome CRISPR um, and a, a uh, setup that we established at Genentech um, to screen all the genes um, to see whether you could get a synthetic lethality um, that would then allow uh, cells to survive. So the idea is we knock out BAP1 and the cells would normally die. If there's some other gene out there that's involved in this pathway and knocking that out with CRISPR allows cells to survive, we'll find it in the screen. And what we found was one really striking hit, which was RNF2. So just to put this in perspective, we don't often see all of the guides that you're targeting in, in uh, one of these CRISPR screens moving in the same direction and so strongly. So this was, this was a really exciting hit. So we went and had a look at what this gene is. It turns out it's an E3 ligase. And what it does, it, it suppresses gene expression. It's part of the PRC1 complex. So what it does is it goes and adds ubiquitins to histone H2A, which then turns off transcription. So this was pretty exciting. It seems as if we'd found two different factors that were opposing each other. So we've got the, the writer, the E3 ligase RNF2 that we identified, which is turning transcription off. And then through the same mechanism, but in reverse, we've got BAP1, which was removing ubiquitins and turning transcription on. So the, the hypothesis here is that there's some fine tuning that's occurring between BAP1 and RNF2. So we went further and said, well, can we start to understand the transcriptional changes that are occurring with BAP1 knockout and with the BAP1 RNF2 double knockout? And so we looked at wild type cells, and then we knocked out BAP1, massive downregulation of genes, as you would expect. We knock out RNF2 as well, and we saw rescue of many of those genes. So this was 
really further supporting this idea of the fine tuning and the interplay between these two factors. So we went back and had another look at our uh, gene expression data for BAP1. Classic volcano plot comparing the wild type and BAP1 knockout cells. And what you might not notice is that way up there in the corner, and then up here too, there are two genes that are massively downregulated in BAP1 knockout, BCL2 and MCL1. These are anti-apoptotic factors. So suddenly we had some idea of, of what it is that's causing these cells to die. It's that you're removing your anti-apoptotic factors. So essentially the default is death. And by having BCL2 and MCL1 there, the cells can survive. So we wanted to understand how that actually happened. So we went and did ChIP-seq using um, an antibody for BAP1. We were able to identify the region just upstream of, of BCL2 that BAP1 is binding. It doesn't bind directly to DNA, but the BAP1 complex. We then did RNF2 ChIP-seq to see where that's binding relative to BAP1, and we found that it binds in a very similar region. And down the bottom here, when you knock out BAP1, RNF2 binding massively increases. So this is also supporting this uh, fine-tuning model that I showed you. To further confirm that really it is this apoptosis pathway we're seeing, we went and knocked out BACs and BAC, which are part of the intrinsic apoptosis pathway. And sure enough, when you knock those out, the, the process that's put in place, uh, that, you know, the cascade that you see when you knock out BAC1 doesn't cause cell death anymore and you have rescue. So this is pretty convincing to us that we now understand that by knocking out BAP1 you're introducing, introducing apoptosis, but that's still a bit of a problem because it still doesn't explain how BAP1's functioning as a tumor suppressor. So um, the next part here is one of those rare moments where I really felt like we had that eureka conversation where it doesn't happen as often in science as I think in the movies, but this is one of them. And what we realized is maybe we were looking in the wrong place. We looked in ES cells, we looked in MEPS. I didn't show you, but we looked in liver and we looked in uh, a couple of other cell types, but we weren't looking in cells relevant to uvial melanoma. So we went back and through the absolutely Herculean efforts of a postdoc, harvested primary melanocytes from mice and then induced, uh, from mice that had this inducible knockout and then induced BAP1 knockout. And we were really surprised to see that by knocking out BAP1 in melanocytes, you actually get increased growth and possibly increased migration as well. So this started to make sense. Essentially, what we're seeing is real context dependence of BAP1. Um, and so then we went, went back and looked, um, this time using uh, CHIP qPCR, to see whether this model that we've built up before with B the BCL1 promoter having this binding of BAP1 held, and sure enough it did, when you delete BAP1, you do not have a, the, a change in recruitment of RNF2. So essentially what's happening is that in the melanocytes, that fine tuning that we saw between BAP1 and RNF2 is happening differently from the other cell types. So then we went back and looked again at our expression data and compared what does it look like when you knock out BAP1 in melanocytes compared to our ES cells. And we got this big splodge um, because there really isn't much correlation at all, or any correlation at all. So way down there is BCL2, which is massively downregulated in the ES cells and doesn't change at all in the melanocytes. But there are lots and lots of changes that are occurring because BAP1 is, is this deubiquitinase that has really quite global effects, but the effects are different and they're cell type dependent. So I think this really speaks to some of the, the comments in the last talk um, with the complexity and really the, the tissue specificity here. Um, we then went and looked at to try and understand what are the changes that are actually happening in melanocytes. And we found um, some just preliminary results, but pretty interesting, uh, thinking about uveal melanoma, which is that MITF is actually upregulated when you knock out BAP1 in melanocytes. And so that's one factor that might be explaining why we're seeing um, proliferation and migration. And even further, when you start to look at um, the uh, target genes for MITF, we also see a change in expression of those in the melanocytes, that almost all of them are going up. So just to summarize all of that into to one slide, what we're really seeing is two very different pathways that are cell type dependent, the context is really important. 
in many cell types, the ES cells, the keratinocytes, and so on, if you knock out BAP1, that causes an increase in RNF2 recruitment to BCL2, you no longer have your anti-apoptotic factor, and you end up inducing apoptosis and the cells die. However, when we're looking at melanocytes, and we found the same, I'm not going to show you, in, in mesothelial cells, when you knock out BAP1, you don't have a change in this recruitment of RNF2, and so then you don't have changes to um, H2A, histone um, uh, ubiquitination of H2A, and so then you don't have cell death, and we even think that we have some factors that are changing, increasing the likelihood of migration and proliferation. So a lot of people worked on this. I just quickly call out uh, Vishpa Dixit and his team at Genentech who did all the experimental work and many people who put in a lot of work to get the CRISPR screens going. Thank you.